it's a great pleasure to have Eleanor Grammy uh, here, and she is one of our um, Daiwa scholars. Um, which year was it? 2012. Yeah. So graduating in 2014. Um, so we sent her to Japan to study Japanese intensively, um, and then to do a work placement. Um, but you're really talking about your homestay here um, in Hokkaido, the northern uh, island of Japan, and. Uh, Elenet is a writer, and um, I also think from, from the relatively small amount of her work I've had the opportunity to read that she's quite a Japanese writer in, in some ways. Um, she has that very sort of subtle, um, delicate style which uh, I associate with people like Kawabata. Um, but you have to buy the book and make up, make up your own mind about that later on. And uh, in conversation with her this evening, we're very lucky to have Dan Bradley. Um, he also spent, um, actually probably longer than Eleanor did, in Japan, three years as a jet um, near Sendai, in Miyagi Prefecture, so also in the northeast of Japan. Um, he did English at Cambridge, and uh, I was quite surprised to discover that he's actually working for Daiwa Capital Markets. Um, now, of course, we are the Daiwa Foundation, and we were originally funded by a very generous donation from Daiwa Securities. Daiwa Capital Markets is actually their um, UK uh, business. So it's quite nice to have that connection as well. So I think I'll pass straight over to the two of you. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, before we start, uh, Element is going to have a really short section. Yeah, so thanks very much for coming. Uh, can you all hear me? Is it loud enough? Fine? Okay. So I'll just start off by reading a a short sample of the, the essay. Um, it's available on, as, a, as a Kindle ebook. Um, and as, uh, as Jason James said, it's um, just kind of based on my experiences of, of Hokkaido, my home state. So, just a sh short reading. The road to Miseko runs through forest and farmland and forest again. The car winds around the hills, moving from dark to bright patches, and dips down into the valley. The sun, filtering through the broad green maple leaves, plays like an old film reel across the windscreen. I catch sight of thin-limbed deer trotting along the roadside before slipping in between the tree trunks. Their tan brown bodies dapple with the woods. A line from an Ainu fairy tale comes back to me. The roots, they wrote, of certain trees are known to turn into bears. Perhaps certain trees also turn into deer. My host family, the Tatinos, are sitting in the front seats. They don't seem interested in the animals, which they see every day, or the different trees, or the camellias blooming furiously in the undergrowth. Instead, when we drive into open terrain, they talk to me about the population size, building works, crops. The vast fields remind me of eastern England, where I once studied, but the vegetables here are different. Potatoes and cabbages, of course, but also edamame beans, sweet Hokkaido pumpkin, daikon, nagaimo, wasabi root. The giant greenhouses send shocks of light onto the surfaces of the road. For miles and miles, there is not a single house. Then they appear, one, two, three, and then nothing again. The houses themselves are otherworldly. There is no uniformity to their architecture, no sense of style. Here is a ski chalet, there a bungalow, a villa, a shack with a roof of corrugated zinc. Tatino-san explains to me that rich Tokyoites buy up land and build their own dream homes. If he's lucky, they'll buy the land from him. <coughs> His mobile rings. Tatino-san, one hand on the wheel, takes the call. Domo, he says, as a greeting, elongating the O. This is manly speech, casual, confident, managerial. No one I know from my Japanese school would start a conversation this way. Domo, he says again at the end. The welcome card that Ateno sent me is still in my coat pocket. The card contains basic list of information. The names, Takashi and Kumiko Tatino, and the name of their dog, Hana. Their ages, 64 and 62, and hobbies, golf and sake for him, books for her. The only personal touch was a line at the bottom of the page, scribbled in kanji, which I spent a long time misreading and translating. We are so looking forward to meeting you, we could have cut our throats. 
They had also enclosed a photograph of the two of them and their dog, Hannah, sitting in their living room. The image showed them distracted, unsmiling perhaps, worried about the timer on the camera or about Hannah keeping still. Now they sit in front of me, their faces partially obscured, their quick speech, like all Japanese, flowing in and out of my comprehension, as if I were eavesdropping on a conversation going on in another room. Without a word, Kuniko opens a bottle of water and brings it to her husband's lips. This is musical chore, he continues, after having a sip. Chore is what we call an area. The town itself is further down the road. We turn off down a one-lane road, the beginning of it decorated with little piles of pumpkins, the lurid orange kind as seen in the supermarkets in Tokyo. We pass two small farmhouses, a dog, a Hokkaido hound, barks wildly after us. We dip into another pocket of woodland and suddenly the world is muffled by the pines, maples and conifers. When we come out the other side, I see suddenly an extraordinary form erupting from the farmland in front of us, a shape so startling that I'm at a loss as to what to say. The timid repetition of the word kire or beautiful won't suffice, a mountain floating in the air, its outline hazy in the pale sky. What is that, I ask? Yotei-san, Kumiko replies, Hokkaido's Mount Fuji. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, well, I suppose my interest started very early on, um, mostly with, with books and literature, really. Like, I had just, my dad happened to have some copies of Yukio Mishima lying around the house. Um, it was um, the Temple of the Golden Pavilion, and um, uh, when the sailor fell from grace from the sea. Yeah, and I read both those novels when I was about 14, 15, and I think, I didn't really understand them at the time. <laughs> Probably still don't understand them now, to be honest, but... Um, <laughs> I just had a sense of this is writing about something, some, a world that I didn't understand and couldn't quite get my finger on, couldn't quite comprehend. But it seemed so, yeah, so fascinating to me. And also, in, in the image of the temple, the golden temple on the cover, I remember that so clearly and wanting to go there, wanting to see it for myself, which I eventually did in 2012 with, with Daiwa. Um, and also there's another image of Yuki Mishima himself, this black and white famous Im uh, picture of him with a rose in his mouth. And I'm thinking, oh, that's, that's, that's so cool, you know, that's so <laughs> amazing. Um, so that's where it started, the beginning of that fascination. And then later on, when I was about 18, I, I met a, a Japanese girl on a sort of, um, I was learning French at the time, so was she. And we lived together in Bordeaux for a few weeks. And she couldn't speak that much English, and obviously we had to speak sort of a mixture of English and French, and I'm getting frustrated trying to speak to her, and I was like, oh, I have to just learn Japanese, you know, and more and more I wanted to do that. And she invited me to come visit her in Tokyo, so I was going to go anyway, and then I heard through a friend about scholarships, so I thought I'd apply, and it was, it was just really good, good timing, and also, you know, it was just... I was so, so happy when, when I actually got the opportunity to go to Japan, yeah. Okay, um, I understand that you, you spent about 18, 19 months in Japan in Tokyo, uh, in Tokyo, as well as uh, the homestay in Hokkaido. Um, like how, how do you compare those two experiences, and then how did that lead to the essay itself? Um, yeah, well, I lived, I, the beginning of the scholarship is, is one year of intensive language learning in Tokyo, and um, and then it was one month in homestay in Hokkaido, and they were totally different worlds um, apart, really. Um, Tokyo was obviously a metropolitan center, very, very busy, and also my experience was there at a language school. It was, I was surrounded by people from, obviously, from the UK, but from Korea, from Taiwan, from Germany, and it was very much as a as a kind of an observer, at, um, looking at the, the city around us, going together on tourist trips, and not quite feeling that you're part of the society. But going to Hokkaido, that was a slight shift then, because I was the only, you know, Westerner in that in that town in Nisiko, 
and um, I lived with a homestead family. I got to practice some Japanese, and through you know improving the language, I could understand more what was going on around me. And um, yeah, and also the quiet, the quiet, <laughs> and the sol and the slight solitude of it, and the opportunity to reflect and observe people. And in Tokyo, it was obviously it's a cliche, same in London, but it's just rushing everywhere. You don't have any time to appreciate uh, the things around you. In Hokkaido, there was a lot of time, and <laughs> and there was a lot of opportunity to reflect, and that's really um, how I started um, writing the, the essay. And also, um, for me, I had personal connections as well with, especially the landscape reminded me sort of nostalg nostalgically of, of Wales because it was autumn and it was wet and it was very green, unlike Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And there was lots of I mean, lots, lots of walks through the countryside, and there were moments where I was I was disorientated and thought I was in Wales, but really I was in, in Japan, and and moments like that you kind of want to want to write about them, really, I suppose. <coughs> yeah. Um, and uh, you so you're learning Japanese in Tokyo for a year. Yeah. Um, but I understand you also translate from German. Yeah. I mean, how are your experiences different learning? Not only of a language, but of a totally different culture. Yeah. I mean, my, my experience is that where the language itself was only part of the obstacle. It was immersing yourself in a completely different way of looking at the world. Yeah. I mean, how did you how did you find that after Germany? Um, yeah, it was it's very very different. But I suppose learning Japanese is um, yeah. The first three months I was learning Japanese, it was like I just couldn't understand it at all. It was completely completely. Um, couldn't get my head around it. It was like a language that floats on its own without any connections to German or Welsh or French at school or Latin. And I, it was almost kind of a, a kind of a logical puzzle. I couldn't quite fit together, you know. And then after about three months, people talked about it often. The kind of eureka moment, or suddenly everything starts falling into place. You're beginning to understand more what people are saying, and it, it makes sense the way it works with language. And then there's a. I suppose it's always like these three stages maybe of learning Japanese. The first one of complete non incomprehension. Second one where you think you've got it, and the third one where you really, really don't, you don't know how to learn it all. It's gone again, you know. So I sort of reached the third stage by the time I left, and kind of you sitting down, you you're managing to speak and get conversation, understanding, but you're only understanding enough to understand that you don't understand. <laughs> yeah. So you, you had some of the, you learned Japanese and after the JET program. How did you find the it was, process? It was um it was complete immersion. So I did English university. I didn't really have much interest in Japan before I arrived there. Yeah. Um, I was just interested in travelling and the, the JET program was a great way to teach. Um, but when I arrived there, I was in a village of six thousand people where no one spoke English, and uh, I was very fortunate that my schools are great and that the students are great, and I just started learning. Uh, threw myself in the deep end and played the internet, and it, it meant that I was learning very quickly. And what happens when you're learning a language in a foreign country is that every day you get really exciting feedback. So every time you learn a new phrase, it's a way to connect with, your, with the people you're speaking to, and it became an obsession. But it, it was kind of like like a magic eye picture where you, at first it's just white noise and nonsense, and then very 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 slowly mm -hmm. it comes together. Yeah. So I think at first it was. You know, I was just um, using phrase books and trying to get by. But I remember reading um, Crown Chin Chan, like, for, like, a, like a kid's comic book, which I love. Uh, but you know, the, the first time you read a comic book, and then the first time you, you can read at the line of the newspaper, all these little, these little yeah, victories yeah. come together. And by, by my third year, I was um, at that stage of like, I knew how much I didn't know, yeah. but I was excited by, but I was still excited by learning. Um, I, I still, I still feel like at the moment I, I'm working at though Captain Mark, Mark is working as a Japanese to English translator, and it's the same experience over again. I, I can read books in Japanese, like non-fiction and fiction books, but I'm translating company reports, so I'm almost back to zero because I know, I know very little about accounting or corporate law. Yeah. Um, so it's an ongoing process. Yeah. I don't think you ever stop learning foreign language. That's the thing. Yeah, so the moment you realise that, it's uh, yeah, <laughs> it's almost exhausting with the idea of how how long you can go on just learning and learning. It's the same with, with 
my German. I mean, mm. I did some German into English translation, translated a short story collection, and it's, you know, although I grew up speaking German, and my dad's German, and my German's still not good enough, you know, it's still, so, so <coughs> it's still, you know, spent another 20 years studying it, and it still wouldn't be absolutely the native, native language kind of level. But certainly learning German was a much simpler, simpler task. <laughs> But I suppose this idea that you mentioned that Japan has, is such a different culture in so many ways. It has different <coughs> perspectives on things and different ways of different um, vocabulary as a result and different kind of concepts. Um, and, and, and as a result of that, it's harder to translate, obviously, into English because you can always be like, well, that's not exactly the, what Japanese are saying that English is not quite matching up. And you're always having to kind of translate around. Yeah, I mean, what I found with literary translation, um, I translated a few short stories by Hitomi Kanehara, that was an author I really like. Um, and what I find is that, unlike technical translation where you're just trying to you know, like get the information across as accurately as you can, <coughs> with literary translation, it's a, re it's a recreative process. You have to not only understand all the words in the Japanese, but capture the sense of what the author is trying to do with um, and that means that there can be rounds and rounds of editing and rewriting and creative uh, interpretation. Um, and I, I was at a talk uh, a few months ago with another translator, and we both did short stories by Haruki Murakami. The same story, very simple little stories, but we both read them in completely different ways. In terms of, you know, one person thought it was a funny story, one person thought it was a, like a, almost like a horror story. Um, but the point is that as a translator, you bring your own personality and your own voice to whatever you're doing. Um, there's no right answer, which is a good or a bad thing. Yeah. I guess the German is more sensitive. You have to be very precise. I mean, because there's such similar languages, you can be very specific and get exactly the right sense in German or English as you would do in the original language. But in Japanese, I feel there's maybe there's more freedom, maybe it's more creative that way as well. You could do, could do more. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I feel like when I'm, when I'm reading Japanese, it's a very different feeling to reading English, because obviously my Japanese is nowhere near as good as my English, but it, I think there's so much space between the words, in, in the sense of, um, yeah, I, I feel like the text has more, more space to breathe, yeah. um, which makes it does make it harder to translate it, but it's kind of a more enjoyable reading experience for me, I think. Yeah. So yeah, in the actual essay, I was talking a bit about um, the Ainu language as well. And I thought about that in relation to Welsh language. And actually, there's a bit in it in the essay where I talk about the original name of Yote San, which is Makari Nupuri in Ainu. And I had to translate that phrase, Makari Nupuri. And Nupuri means mountain in Ainu language. And Makari, I think, <laughs> I think it was something a beautiful, beautiful <coughs> river, or beautiful. And I was trying to look it up in various dictionaries, and they've got lots of different kind of translations. And I was, you know, what if someone knows any I knew in the audience might tell me exactly what the translation is, but being conscious when I was writing this, I was like, oh God, you know, I'm not, as a translator, I'm not certain that this is completely the right translation. <coughs> that at some point you just have to let go and say, that's, that's the impression that I got, that's, that's the kind of translation that I, I want. Yeah, I mean, what, what I found with literary translation is that like, there's always, I was everything to be done. There's always, um, I can translate a story and then ask Japanese friends for feedback and sort of like answer questions. But then I'd go to an editor, and an editor will see things that we couldn't see because we're too close to the original Japanese. Um, and what you find is that you have to sort of, yeah, you, you come to a stage where you have to accept that, you know, You've only got your interpretation, and there's definitely the people who are going to disagree yeah, with that. That's right, yeah. Yeah. And one, one thing that struck me during the essay, actually, is that there's a lot of, lots of the sections start with poetry, or quotes from books, and there's a lot of, lots of sort of play with characters and letters. And, I mean, is that something that really sort of informs your work as a writer? Yeah. Um, I mean, not your fiction as well. As yeah, I suppose, I, I guess any, any writer would say it's the same, like, to you to write, I find that I just need to read constantly ev everything. And then, I don't, depending on what I'm reading at the time, it definitely influences what I'm writing. 
it's a, just a direct, complete direct link. Um, and especially when I was actually, one of the reasons why I sat down to write this na nature essay was because I was reading at the time um, Rebecca Solnit, The Far Away Nearby, and Robert McFarlane as well, The Old Ways. And I was really, I found those, I mean, it's a huge um, increase in nature writing at the moment, and uh, lots of really, really great books, for instance, Pages for Hawk, obviously, is a famous example. But I was really um, so sort of inspired, I guess, by the idea of this new, well, I suppose not that new, but this form of memoir and nature writing, but and as well as everything else in between. Because Rebecca Solnit, she takes tiny sort of details, um, for instance, an apricot in her mother's drawer, and she weaves around this tiny detail a huge kind of universe of uh, different thoughts, philosophies, um, memories, family dramas. It all comes out of this kind of, this image, this metaphor. And I thought, well, I just, you know, obviously I took that and, and tried to do the same thing because it gives you so much freedom as a writer. Before I thought, oh no, I have to write a novel or a short story and it has to have this certain arc. You know, there's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end. It has to, the characters have to be believable and so and so in this, this and that way and the motives or what have you. <coughs> but then I saw this, this new form gives you so much freedom to talk about all sorts of subjects and bring them together. In, in, in an interesting way, and I try to do that in this essay with your taste on as a focus, and have everything else sort of um, hang from this from this metaphor, from this symbol of musical. It's a really stunning mountain if you've ever seen it. It's, it looks exactly like Mount Fuji, um, but a bit smaller, and it's just it's, and you just I don't know you're just driving along and suddenly you look to your right or whatever, and it's this huge huge mountain just in the middle of a almost flat landscape. It's, it's really impressive, and yeah, as I said, I was, I was there in homestay uh, in October, and it was autumn. Um, but when I first arrived, it was completely green the landscape, and as and then four weeks later, it completely changed. It was red. It was the middle of autumn colours. It was coyote, and it was even some s snow sort of dusting on the top of your tail, Sam. And um, yeah, I never seen the landscape transform so quickly. Obviously, we don't have the similar climate in Britain, and I was struck struck by that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, there was there was one there was one quote actually that to do with, with nature where uh, you said that you're reading the Secret Garden while yeah. you were there, and you mentioned this idea of nature sort of improving and changing you. Yeah. I mean, was that something you experienced while you were there? Yeah, I suppose it was sort of antidote to Tokyo in a way. <laughs> after after living in, in for a year in a big city and living in a, a, a small apartment and sort of traveling, you know, to, to school every day, and it was it was brilliant living in Tokyo. But in some ways, it was this, always this kind of claustrophobia and kind of restraint of living in a big city and having your commute. And this was in a way a holiday, a break from all that. And and I was reading the Secret Garden at the time. Because when you spend a lot of time in different countries, you start getting really nostalgic for home and start picking up the old sort of children's books from that I used to used to read. And I thought well, it was a perfect book for that that moment in time when I was walking out in the countryside and cycling everywhere, and I felt really free. And and I read this this book, which is about that really, um, in a lot of ways, and how nature and um, can really transform transform a person, mm. and it, and there's always different layers of transformation. I suppose the transformation in myself, transformation in my environment, and also the natural yeah. landscape around me, and in the, in the coil. So, okay. yeah. I mean, bearing that in mind, I mean, sort of, this essay has just won the New Welsh Writing Award. I mean, what impact has that had on sort of the way you see yourself? I know you've had some small publications. Yeah, I had a huge impact on me, I have to say. Like, um, I didn't expect to win it at all. And um, and before that, you know, I've always dreamed of spending, just um, sort of quitting the day job and writing. And then because of this, really, I, I did I did that. And I, I, I was working at Literature Wales at the time, um, well, earlier this year, and I, I, um, the project came to an end, so I stopped. And now I'm, I'm writing a novel and concentrating on that full time and trying to be a writer and it gave me this gave me the confidence to do that. Um, yeah. And it was really wonderful as well because 
there were other, obviously, other writers and other pieces um, uh, which were um, in the competition. I met the other writers, uh, Elaine Ewart and Philip Jones, who were also nature writers, and having getting to read their pieces was interesting as well, because it was a completely different topic. So there's a ornithology, sort of about Helgoland and, and birds, and then and Philip wrote about um, surfing and the science of waves and. Yeah, I mean, it's always interesting to discover new, new writers, new works. Yeah. yeah. And could you tell us some more about the new novel? The novel, yeah, I could. <laughs> <laughs> I could do that. Um, yeah, so I've been writing, I've been writing about on this novel for, for years, really. But it's um, it's also set in partly set in Japan, and it's about um, Hikikomori, which I know is, is very familiar to people who who know Japan. But actually, I wrote a short story about Hikamori, and I got it was published in a Welsh anthology. And the editor at the time thought it was magic realism. She didn't. It was about a boy locked in a room, and she thought it was magic realist because she hadn't she had not, not heard of it before. Um, which is fair enough, really. It's, it is almost a fantastical kind of notion that someone can't come out of their room. But it's a social problem in, in Japan. And I was when I was there in Tokyo and in Hokkaido, I met people. I think a lot of people have who who have had relatives and friends who, who didn't come out of their rooms for for years and found it hard to adjust to the society. It's like the huge leap between your parents' house and the outside world, which I think everyone can um, everyone can kind of uh, sympathise and empathise with that in, in different ways. And then there's the kind of the there is a big gap to bridge there really between the kind of set path of school, university, and then life or work and trying to, having the confidence to go out there and make your own life and be independent and for whatever reason not being able to do that. So that's what the novel is trying to deal with and I'm trying to write about at the moment. I mean, uh, as you were saying that, it kind of went back to what you were talking about earlier on about immersing yourself in that culture and, and experiencing that change. I mean, yeah. when I went to Japan, I was trying to work out what I wanted to be when I was a grown-up. Yeah. And teaching yeah. English in Japan was a nice way to sort of travel and see different things. <coughs> but being in a small village where everyone was an important part of, of every event and every, every sort of thing that happened, yeah. I kind of realised how sort of self-centred, in, in some ways, the sort of life I'd led before was. Uh, and it was so different to be sort of in, in this in this sort of environment where it's very important to to contribute, yeah. um, and for me that that led to lots of positive changes. It encouraged me to move into translation, which meant that I could sort of get to write and translate books and read books for a living. Um, it was a, yeah, it was a really powerful experience to be immersed in such a different culture, yeah. and. Uh, mm -hmm. It's difficult to come home then, but yeah. it's, <laughs> it's always always adjusting. It's so hard, isn't it? But yeah, but I found the l little things always fascinated me about diff slightly different kind of perspectives of, as I said, the society in Japan and in Britain. For instance, this um, I always found really interesting is the attitude towards sleep in in Japan. The idea is that it's healthier to have little sleep. As possible, so you can do lots of other things. <laughs> so I remember there was someone in, in my office. I used to come into the office, uh, you know, when I was working in Japan, and uh, she she was always there at eight a.m. and she'd been awake since four. And I was like, oh why? <laughs> but you know, it's a sense of leading a happy lifestyle and I don't know, getting lots of stuff done. Don't you don't need to sleep for ten hours. That's not that's not healthy, you know. And I was you know, I've grown up with the opinion that. As much sleep as possible. <laughs> so that's, um, have naps if you can, you know. So, although it's really small, but mm. that all the time, always in this, in attitudes towards daily life, it's like a slightly different perspective. And I think it's quite, um, it was quite inspirational and uh, for a writer to see, you know, you think you know your world, you think you know the where you're living, where you are, and then actually know someone next to you sees it slightly differently. And it's kind of an exercise in, in empathy and yeah, you know, change of perspective. Yeah, and it's it's not something that really it doesn't really like you, you can't you, as long as you're living in Japan, you learn new things. I mean, I was there for three years, and there were constant experiences where I kind of had to reassess where I was and what I was doing. Yeah. It's um, 
yeah, you have to really sort of deconstruct who you are and try and fit into what's quite an unusual situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, sure. yeah.